Okay. Yeah, my name is Akinola Emmanuel. So I'm uh, taking notes on asset management today. Um, but before we came into the class, we're going to have like 10 or 15 minute brainstorming all together. I think I will entertain like uh, two or three live experience one or two challenges you have in your current working place. Let's discuss it together and let's see what we can bring it, um, bring out of it. So I will only allow three people to bring up one or two. So we deliberate and discuss on it because I know every one of us here have one or two challenges at our current working place. So let me take on Mr. Abayomi Adekoya. Mr. Abayomi Adekoya. Mr. Yeah. Abayomi. Hello, sir. Yeah, please unmute yourself and tell us what is the current challenge you are facing in your current working place. Are you going now? Is that? No, 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 no. I have five phones. Mr. Biomi. <clears throat> yeah, hello, sir. Okay, go ahead, sir. Yeah, I can't really say I'm really having a challenge for now okay. Okay. because by the virtue of what I do here, I, I work in a telecom environment and okay. uh, the people I work with, you know, they are specialists, like people who, okay. are, who have a specialization in uh, radio in the uh, integration of the uh, sites and uh, they do all the network stuff. They are experts, they are specialists in radio. But okay, I can really say I have a challenge too, in the sense that uh, there are many things that they don't understand, most especially with respect to operations and the maintenance, that whenever I'm talking to them, you know, be, probably because they are not trained in uh, that area, most especially in areas like HSE, and uh, some other things that I'm trying to tell them how to do it. Then they feel somehow that, uh, who is this person? Why is he talking? Because I'm not really an engineer, but I'm talking to them about uh, from the business perspective. And they always find it difficult to understand uh, what I bring to the fore. Okay, Mr. Koyomi. Um, the, 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 the way I view it, you know, at times, like um, a Yoruba did you say, when I said, I'm sorry, there's a difference between I'm sorry and I'm deeply sorry. Presentation matters most in everything we do because there is a way you can present the case to them and it seems as if you are actually controlling them. And there is another way you can present it to them and they will see meaning what you are actually saying. One, presentation matter most. Then the second thing is that if you let people see the benefit of what you are actually trying to like bring up, I want to believe every human being will want to listen to you. Find their professional, but you as a facility manager, you are not a professional. I always tell everybody that as a facility manager, you are not a professional, you are a generalist because you cross across every other field, come to communication, come to whatever, you should be there because that is more or less like a project. And as a facility manager on that side, you are more or less like the project manager. So in terms of HSC, you have to implement it. So you just have to let them know the reason why what you're actually bringing up is very, very important. And what advantage does they, do they start to gain in getting that in done? That's very, very key. I hope that shed more light, Mr. Abayomi. Hello, Mr. Abayomi. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. So I think in the course of this um, program, I know there is going to be a difference between you of today and you of maybe in the next two months. Because I can assure you, Mass Good will have loaded you with a lot of knowledge. So we we'll always try to make sure that our student doesn't go by the same way they came. So I'm listening to, can somebody else give us another real life uh, challenge? Let's deliberate on it again. So I don't want to do, I don't want to pick up on anybody this time around. So 
If you have anything you need to discuss, just raise up your hand and I'll call on you. Then you can go ahead. Mr. Abayami, you are still raising your hand. We've attended to you. Maybe it's the former one or the new one. No, no, no. No, I came in late, sir, and I don't know the person talking. Okay. My name is Akinola Emanuel. Okay, okay. So I'm the one handling the facility uh, asset management for today's class. Okay. So before okay, we go sir. into Thank the you, class, sir. before we go into the class, we are trying to like um, discuss on real life uh, work uh, challenges. So we're dedicating like five, 10 minutes for that. So we've discussed on one then, I'm expecting somebody else to come up with another challenge again. So you can signify by raising up your hand. Class. Okay. Okay. Then, yeah. or oh, can we possibly do a recap on the last class? Oh, two people are raising their hand already. Can you hear me? I said one first. Let's take it. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Okay, Mr. Afis, please go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, sir. Mr. Abaya, you need to drop your hand, please. So, Mr. Afis, go ahead, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is... Good evening, Mr. Afis. Uh, my name is... Uh, can you hear me, sir? I can hear you clearly. Okay. <clears throat> my name is Afis Faji. Um, I am not... I'm not in a paid employment. I am um, a self-employed um, person. And... Um, my main my main uh, area of work <laughs> as regards facility management oh, no, no, is, is, work. is cleaning. Cleaning, and okay. So, uh, yes, it's cleaning. I'm I'm into cleaning, and I'm self-employed. So over time, my main challenge has um, been relationship with um with with um owners of the job and then at times the supervisors of the job. Also, another challenge I have is, um, is pricing in the industry. Although I'm quite, I'm, I, can, I won't say I'm a professional yet, but this is, this is something I picked up while I was working in a corporate environment. And um, in a corporate environment, and I just picked it up and said, okay, let me expand on it. So why I find myself in marketing gold is that I want to expand my scope and learn more into um, learn more on what facility management in, is all about. But in the area where I'm working, the two challenges I have is relationship with the um, the job owners and perhaps maybe the engineers, supervision, supervisory engineers on site, and then my pricing. Those are those are the two areas where I have challenges. Okay, if I may call me, Mr. Hafiz, for those clients that you are currently serving, was there any written agreement? Well, um, my, my, there's no written agreement per se. Okay. But what I do normally is that um, if I'm called to do a job, okay. if I'm invited to do a job, I go for a site inspection. I okay. inspect the I expect, inspect the, 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 the building and mm. the extent of cleaning that is supposed to be done. Mm. And then I come up with a quote. Mm. Um, I also lies with somebody who is a facility manage, manage, manager, mm. a friend though, but I don't know the extent. I don't know his certification level, but he's been working as a facility manager on his own as well. So I lies with him and he gives me an idea of what the price range as per different kinds of job are. So I just use my um, 
my little experience to, to determine pricing. At times it's high, at times it's below, it's below margin. At times I lose, at times I over gain. So, so that's what I do. But coming here, I think I want to, I want to now be a, a real professional so that I can do the appropriate pricing and do the normal things that um, somebody who is a facility manager will be able to do. Okay, Mr. Fis, the reason why I ask that question is that for every cleaning services, no matter how big or minor it is, are supposed to be, even if it is just on area addendum, and that should spell out the minimum expected cleaning um, that, the, that the client wants. That is one. Then two, because in the course of your job, you're definitely going to come across several numbers of clients. There are some that we want you to, that want to like sign a more possibly like a year agreement with you. And there are some that you just want cleaners to go. Come, do the cleaning and go. So, but for every cleaning services you are going to render, that must be, it must be clearly spelled out that this is the minimum number of cleaning that we want. All the table must be dust free. So when you are doing your quotation, there must be an extra sheet that will be added to it that will spell out the terms the, and conditions. And also, what are the scope of the cleaning you are going to carry it out? It could be part of your scope of work that, okay, this clinic services cannot be done in the afternoon. It has to be done overnight. And because of the fact that this cleaning service has to be done overnight, it's going to attract a social percentage of cost. If it's going to be done in the afternoon, fine. This is the amount of money I'm going to charge. And in terms of costing, you as a cleaning personnel uh, practitioner, there are a lot of factors that determine your cost. One, you have to consider manpower because you cannot do all the cleaning yourself. You have people that you are going to pay for the job. You have to consider how much are, going, are you going to pay um, your staff. Then two, you talk in terms of material cost, your mop head, your scrubbing brushes, your detergent, and there are some certain area that require some specific detergent or specific cleaning materials. Possibly you want to clean your glass that are glass cleaning. So if you are going to use three, maybe three, um, one, one liter size of a, um, your glass cleaning material, it comes at a cost. These are all the material you are going to list it. Then you list all the material, then you build your contingency into it, your transportation cost to and fro, then your profit margin. The only thing you must ensure is that you shouldn't put a profit margin that is as high as almost about 50% of the total cost, no. But your cost, uh, your, cost uh, your profit margin must be justifiable. So these are all what you are going to put in your cost. That's what you are going to determine. You can start measuring your cost in terms of per square area. You can do per square area. If I'm cleaning per square area, this is the cost. And that cost per square area will determine the number of manpower the number of hours you are going to use to do that job, the material you are going to use, and all the necessary material involved. So there are several numbers of ways you can move around your costing. So Mr. Avis, I hope that's um, give you a little clue. Yeah, yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. Oh, okay, sir. Yes. So I'm going to take, what do you say, Mr. Sir. Avis? So I said, it's okay, sir, I'm okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So let me take one more, um, one more live example, uh, live challenge again. Then we move into the class. I think I have somebody raising up his or hand. Yes. Okay, go ahead, ma. Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma. Can you hear me, sir? Clearly, ma. Okay. I'm um, sorry. Yeah, I'm actually in the KK right now, but I, I, I think I'm permitted to speak, right? Why not, if not? As long as, as the KK no, rider, no, okay, as, as long as the KK rider is not listening to what we're saying, because he has to pay for the class at the same time. <laughs> He's listening to it. Okay, so I, I'm having a challenge now. The one I'm coming out from, which um, is making me to 
actually decided that I'm not I'm I'm not going to continue with the job because it's affecting my uh, my health right now. Okay. Now I'm managing a site as the clean site manager. So the site manager. You're going to give me the clean site. Yes. Huh? Now I have some I have supervisors and I have um, janitors that I'm managing. So, okay. Um and now I'm a detailed person and then I'm also a disciplinarian. So what it means is that I make sure that they do the job the way it's supposed to be done. But right now, all the way, there is this one of this my supervisor who has been eyeing that position of the manager and all that. And now he has he pulled the, um, some janitors to go and meet the MG to tell him that I was, you know, maltreating them. And then I got from his office that they went and told them that I'm giving them empty work. And now this our this my company, yeah, standard uh, cleaning company that needs, uh, you know, that that they want a standard job to be done. And then I'm trying to get a standard job. And they told me that I was uh, giving them too much work. And then the company is summoning me and they are penalizing me for giving the janitors a job to do. Meanwhile, they told me that they were coming for inspection. So I needed the job to be done. So how do I manage that situation? Because it's a very big challenge for me now. Did you get what I said? I, I, I heard you clearly. So, but those, um, those staff, are they Please, directly reporting? Sorry, sir. Can you rephrase the question? We don't, we, we didn't get it from you. I, I... Hello? Can, can you can you please um, summarize up the question again? Because some of the people are in the class are not actually getting the question. And I want everybody okay, to okay. learn from what we're saying. Okay, I said I am a site manager somewhere where I okay. have supervisors and janitors working with me. So now the summary of the whole thing is that there is a conspiracy, you know, the supervisor in question is eyeing the position of the manager, which they are giving to me money and giving the, the manager right now. And the, the issue is that it took some us to our head office to tell the management that I gave them too much work to do. And the management is punishing me because I gave the janitors work to do. And they are standard people that need the site to be uh, cleaned in a standard way. So, and I am trying to live up to that standard. And this is what I have gotten. So I'm saying that how do I, manage the situation because as it is i want to drop the job okay um the first question i needed to ask you those janitors are they your direct report are they directly reporting to you yes 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 they are directly reporting to you yes they are if, they are directly reporting they are, to they me are directly reporting, are directly reporting to, to me if they are yes. actually reporting to you they need to justify their range time you know what I mean by range time? Sir? Eh? I said if they, are, if they are actually reporting to you, they needed to yeah. justify their range time. You know what I mean by range time? No. Okay. If you have a star that reports to you, you need to work in the morning, and the star doesn't do any work, see close of work in the evening, that means the staff has achieved what we call zero range time. Rest time is the amount of hour that a star spend on his particular responsibility every day at work. If they are directly reporting to you, you are the one that will determine what they do. And every one of them have what they call judge discussion. So if they say you are giving them much job to do, I think you, it's not depend on the way you present the job to them, but if you're actually giving them what they are, what is actually their obligation, I don't think anybody could hold you responsible for that. Then you said you are somebody who is very key about detailing. I give you kudos for that. Because if you are giving into detailing, even if you leave that job, whichever place you are going to, you still continue giving whatever to detailing. Fine, somebody somewhere, somewhere might not appreciate what you are doing now. But I can assure you, don't relent in giving whatever to detailing. 
Because what you're actually fulfilling now is the axis of the professionalism. So it's going to pay off at the end of the day. But if your manager is taking it on you, you need to understand why your manager is taking it on you. So there is no any manager anywhere that is not approachable. To me, I will just give you a very simple advice. Why can't you just approach your manager and understand the angle at which your manager is coming from? You might be mistaking your manager for another thing. Possibly they have told him something and he has refused to hear from your other side. So it is better you allow him to just judge between you and them. And the way you can make a very good judgment is you telling him what is entail and they also saying their mind at the same time. And don't be surprised if we even go to the extent of him calling the two of you, calling you and calling those to your staff together. So I wouldn't want you to start having a kind of a bad impression about your manager. Try to approach your manager, try to understand the angle at which he's coming from. But the only thing I will also advise you is that don't let that toxic, because to you now, the environment is becoming toxic. Please don't allow that toxic environment, toxic culture to affect your professionalism, to affect the ethics of the profession, which you have already, uh, you have already imbibed. Mr. Abumi, I will still come back to you when I'm done. I can see you're raising up your hand. So let me just um, complete with Ms. Uh, Madam Juliana first. So after that, I'll come back to you. So first thing first, people management is very, very key. And I think in the, in the scope of this um, course, you're going to learn a lot about people management because you are going to do leadership as a course. Because we can, we can also tell there could be one or two shortcomings at your own end in terms of people's management. Because at times, it's, uh, a part at the back goes a long way. It can even do more than even giving somebody money. Possibly we can tell. Maybe your approach at the same time is not in tune with the way it should be. That could also be part of it. And that's the reason why in the course of this program, you're going to learn what we call leadership and you are going to learn what we call people's management. And there is something we call management of, management of change. Every human being always appreciate their current position. They don't want to change. So when you want to push them from where they are to another place, it's always a challenge. And that's the reason why when it comes to management of change, there is something we call the frog, uh, the theory of the frog. And that is where you talk about unfreezing, you unfreeze, you mold, and you refreeze. The first thing you take people out of their freezing zone, their comfort zone, met them. When you met them, for them or shape them to the shape you want. Then take back, take them back to the freezer and refreeze them again. When once there is anything called change in any in any uh, company or in any uh, establishment, there are people that we call early adopters. Only two percent are early adopters in any, when it's come to change management. And these are people that we terms as innovator in every company. Then we have. Uh, late adopters, those are just like 14%. Then you have majority adopters. Majority adopters are waiting for the 14% to achieve, to accept that change before the key into it. But there are some people that are called die hard that no matter how, whatever you do, they will never change. So in the course of this program, you're still going to learn what we call change management and leadership management and people management. So possibly the way you are handling it might not be the way that is in tune with the way they want to be. That could be part of the reason. So as time goes on, by the time you learn much about how to handle people, how to manage change in a business environment, possibly don't be surprised that almost about 80% of those who are your janitor will fall in line. It is not mean that 100% of them will accept what you are giving to them. But the way you present it also matters most. There are ways you can give people several numbers of tasks to perform, but the, mat the way you present it matters most. So, Ms. Juliana, 
please, I will advise you, don't start thinking about leaving that job now. Try as much as possible to approach your immediate boss and try to understand the angle at which is coming from why he's punishing you for giving people some extra tasks to do. By the time you hear him out, you'll be able to deduce the reason why he's taking some action against you. And if he still insists, to me, try to fulfill the axis of the profession and move on. I hope that shed more light to your current challenge, ma'am. Madam Juliana, please, you can unmute yourself. I hope that this shed some light. Did I mute myself? Um, okay. well. To some certain extent. Think, yeah, the thing is, um, you know, because the way I'm saying it, you may not understand what has gone. I do. The extent that the extent at which it has gone, this is something, it's not something of um, maybe matter of you want them to change and all that. The thing is, the person in question manipulate, is manipulating them so that he can take over the management, which, which he has already done, now, which they've already given him. So the, work, the job in question is for, is this for this, um, this for this, um, holiday, that's Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Uh -huh. So I gave them tax for that holiday. So because the guy does not want to do the job, he encouraged the other janitors to go to the head office. And the thing where I'm coming from is this, the management did not call me to confirm the reason why, uh, okay, why did I give them this job? Nobody called me, but they just took decision and told me to re resume today in the head office, leaving my site. So that's why I'm trying, I'm, that's why where I'm coming from. So that when next something like this happens, I know how to manage it. That's why I bring it up here. But, but if it's that one, they've already settled it and took their decision. I mean, I've already also taken my own decision that I may not take the position where they are giving me. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're much welcome. I think Mr. Bumi was raising his hand. That will be the last one I'm going to take because we have one or two things to cover in the course of this program. Mr. Bumi. Oh, good evening, sir. It is Mrs. Oh, Bumi. Sorry, ma. <laughs> good evening, yeah. ma. Um, I think um, the last person that spoke has actually concluded the matter. You have spoken well. You actually touched quite a number of areas on that issue affecting her. I just wanted to add that when it comes to corporate settings, documentations are key. At the point where you were advising her to have a talk with them, the management, I wanted to suggest that she should arm herself with documents. You know, you don't go to such meetings just talking, you know, from your brain. There should be supporting documents this is what they ought to be doing this is why i did this everything you know documented that speaks volumes or else you just be going forth and back and talking but when there are documentations it helps a lot that that was just what i wanted to add but now that she has concluded that was why i re um, lowered my hand <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much Ms. Uh, madam i really appreciate your comment so, Madam Juliana, at least you're picking up that at least subsequent one. So, you know, you should be documenting exactly. everything. Yes. Though, though what she said, I, I actually did what she said and I presented everything for them today. But just that they have already taken their decision and uh, they've concluded and they have taken their decision. That's why I also took my own decision. But I appreciate if, in yeah, case in if I go to another place. So I will have to also do what she said. In, in that regard, to me, if you actually done that, you have, to me, you have done what they call, you have fulfilled the ethics of the business, uh, the ethics of the profession. So that means to be professional. I, but I have records on my phone. I have the uh, documents on my phone. Everything yeah. I gave to them, I have it on my phone, which I have yeah. shown them today. So yeah. it's yeah. just a yeah. um, conspiracy. Yeah. Just conspiracy. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, ma. 
So uh, I think we pick up one or two things from those um, real life uh, challenges. So we need to go to the class of today, um, asset management. So I want all of us to mount our speakers. So by the virtue of power confound of me, I'll be the only one speaking. And at the end of the class, we do one or uh, entertain one or two questions or before we call it up then. At the end of the slide, there is um, an assessment which we are to do and submit. And I'm so sure we know the mode of submission. So thank you very much. Asset management. So in the core, in the course of this uh, asset management, we'll be learning the economic objective of asset, which means if you have a good asset management in place, asset strategy and policies in place, you still stand the chance of reselling your asset at a very good value at the, uh, at the end of its um, useful lifespan. Then with your good asset management, you can improve efficiency of your asset, the performance of your asset and utilization of your asset. These are all areas where we shall be touching in the course of this um, um, topic. Then facilitating of asset data collection, then enhancing the asset life cycle and improving operational performance and efficiency. These are all the objective of what we shall be discussing in the course of this program today. So, and what is an asset? An asset is anything that can retain value for more than a year. And this is quite different from uh, normal consumables. Because your consumable at times, it doesn't last for more than one month or two months. Then, apart from the fact that asset lasts more than a year, it is more or less like uh, a property that a, a corporate organization owns. And not just only that they own that uh, um, asset, it's also one way or the other, giving them a kind of either direct or indirect benefit. The benefit from it, from it. and they has it as a use, and it also has economic factor, which is the, the fact that it generates income into the what into the corporate organization. Just like your real estate is an asset, your computer is an asset, either directly or indirectly, it's generating money, and your even your staff, they are more or less like an asset, and that's the reason why most of the time you will refer to human resources manager as an asset manager. So it's a resources with economic value own with the expectation that it will provide future benefits, either in terms of money or in terms of direct value or indirect value. So assets are any thing that can retain value beyond a year. And in accounting context, you can refer it to it as either current or fixed asset. When you talk about current assets, it means that asset that can be consumed within a year. And what we mean by your fixed asset are those ones that cannot be consumed within a year. Your account receivable are asset, your inventory are asset, your cash flow is an asset. These are something that you can consume within a span of one year. Your account receivable are more or less like sales that you've already what sell out, that you are more or less like expecting the money. It's not that you have the physical cash in your hand, but you know you have that money in stock somewhere. Those are account receivable. And your fixed assets are assets that can retain value more than what one year. So, what are the types of assets? You have financial assets. Your banking industry perform what we call financial asset management. You have infrastructure, uh, infrastructure asset management, like um, Nigeria Railway Corporation. These are all infrastructure asset management. Uh, asset management. Yeah, you have Nigeria Water Corporation. You have Federal Fire System. You have enterprise mm. asset manager, you have physical plant asset management, like all this construction industry. They have a lot of physical plants, like all these their caterpillars, their mowers, their vibrators. These are all physical. Then real estate asset manager management. If you are fortunate to be an asset, a facility manager in somewhere like a 1004 estate, what you're actually performing is what asset, uh, real estate asset management. Then you have HR asset management. Who does who are the asset to HR? The employee. They are all asset to what? Human resources manager. 
Then what are the factors that differentiate an asset manager from a facility manager? One, you start talking about the asset that the two of them manage. An asset manager and a facility manager, the asset that the two of them manage, the type of asset they manage, determine, differentiate the two of them. Then the purpose of the asset also determine the difference between them. The life cycle of the asset also determine the what the difference between a, an asset manager and what a facility manager. And at times, it all depends on the corporate environment. There are some certain corporate environment that the facility manager, the onus of asset management, still lies on the head of the facility manager. So, but it all depends on how expandable your corporate organization is. If your corporate organization is so bogus to the extent that you have several numbers of branches and you have a lot of assets lying down in several numbers of states or countries, at that period in time, the company can decide to say, okay, sorry, we are going to separate an asset management from what facility manager. So they get an asset manager who is completely in care of all the company assets. But that doesn't say the facility manager and the asset manager will not be working together because there are some certain information that the asset manager or the facility manager will require from asset manager or the asset manager might require some fast certain um, facility up, uh, update from the um, facility manager. So the two of them work hand in hand, but the type of assets they manage, differentiate them, the purpose of the asset differentiate them, the life cycle of the asset also differentiate them, the organizational goal of the asset also differentiate them, as in the organizational goal in terms of how critical the asset is to the world, to the organization then, the assigned scope of the operation of that um, asset also what differentiate them. Then the different in the scope of application, asset manager is applied to both core and what support business processes. Why facility manager focus on support business processes? So the asset manager deal with core, both accounting aspect of the operation of the business, both accounting, the facility manager only based on what support business in terms of how to make sure that the, um, the facility are in what in good upkeep. Then on the operational level, facility manager and asset manager manage many services in the area of maintenance, operations, safety, logistic, and technical infrastructure. So there are some certain period that a facility manager might require some information from uh, an asset manager in terms of book value of an asset, in terms of what is the book value. Because for every asset, there is a certain amount of money that an asset manager takes away every month, which form part of your uh, uh accounting document which form part of your trial balance at the end of the month so you start taking what we call depreciation so at times when you want to replace an asset what a facility manager needed from an asset manager is the what is the current book value of that particular asset and that's the reason why at times you see that in some corporate environment the facility manager and the asset or accounting managers are not always in tune because at times, a facility manager might be asking for an outright replacement of an asset. But an accounting manager is looking at the book value. And he knows that on that particular as asset, he still have a lot of what depreciation going on. So the accounting manager might not agree with what the facility manager for an outright replacement of an asset. Apart from the fact that, okay, possibly the budget, the current year budget might not be enough to like fund that um, asset replacement. Apart from that, no. book value is still another factor that can do, that can hinder or that can stop an asset manager from giving an approval for a replay, a natural replacement for an asset. Please, can we, can, somebody still having his uh, speakers on muted? Yeah, Someone's waiting for me. It took me 10 minutes. I can still hear some background noise. Please, can we all mute our speakers? So both asset manager and facility manager also use shared management concept like asset utilization rates, asset register, asset replacement value, total cost of ownership. When you are talking about total cost of ownership in asset management, you are talking about the cost of planning because when you are talking about planning stage of an asset, you have a lot of management decision. You sit down, you discuss, 
And in that period in time, it's a multidisciplinary um, uh, kind of action. There are times it might not be only the facility manager alone. It might include the facility manager, the finance manager, the supply chain manager. Then at times, it could even include you to be involved a structural engineer or an architect. So during the planning stage, then it involves cost because you might eventually need to pay your architect per, uh, per meeting. Or it could even include you inviting your legal department. And these are things that come at a cost. The cost of planning, the cost of design, after design, the cost of that project, and after that project, the cost of delivery, cost of commissioning, cost of repair and maintenance during the asset lifetime, and the cost of salvage value. Either you want to resell or you want to dismantle the asset or you want to dispose it of. All these costs zoom up together is what the term, what the terms as total cost of ownership. Then critical condition, criticality condition index, the youth. They utilize similar analytical technique, method, procedure, and IT solution. These are areas where an asset manager and a facility manager share information in order to come up with a strategic uh, management decision. Then the difference between asset and inventory. At times, some people call it inventory. Some people call it asset, but inventory are more or less like consumables, while your assets are things that retain value beyond a year. So assets are item of value that you want to track closely because of their importance to management decisions and of their importance to your accounting account statement on a monthly basis. So you have to track your assets closely. They are more or less like a baby that you have to put, uh, you have to keep abreast, such as your computer, your printer, your phone, your vehicles, your office furniture. These are all classified as assets. If I am a facility manager in a forestry environment, my tree are more or less like my asset because these are things that can turn into money to physical cash as time goes on. If I sell a tree, I know the amount of money that is going to come out of it for me. So inventory includes items that are used once or last only a short time. And I also reverse to as what consumable. Such items do not need to be what track costly because you can only take inventory. The reason why you take inventory is because you want to replace them. Like your printed paper in the office, your staple print your eraser, your pencils, your biro, these are all classified under inventory. And the reason why you take invent uh, you take note of this one is because you want to replace them, you don't want to actually run out of what. Okay, so, but knowing the quantity on hand is valuable so that they can be what? Reordered. Example include your office supplies, such as staples, notebooks, marker. These are all classified under inventory. So, what is asset management? Asset management is a coordinated activities of an organization to realize value from that asset. Coordinated activity in the sense that it is not only a single person that coordinates that activity. For instance, let's take a generator for an exa example. Buy a generator, you install that generator, then the onus of the maintenance lies in the hand of the, what, the maintenance manager, uh, the facility manager. But the accounting manager still take part in how to, how, to maintain, how to maintain that generator because if the accounting manager doesn't release this money, for the facility manager to buy engine oil, to buy um, oil filter, to buy foil filter, and to get that generator service, there is nothing the facility manager can do. That's the reason why it is called a coordinated activity of an organization to realize the value from an asset. And at the same time, the facility manager still has a supervisor. The facility, the supervisor is the one that notified the board, the facility manager, that this generator is almost due for what for servicing. So it is now depend on either the generator is being serviced in house or through an external vendor. So that's the reason why it is what a coordinated what activity. And it's a systematic process of what deploying an asset, operating an asset. 
like a generator that I said the other time, maintaining an asset, upgrading an asset or disposing of an asset, what? Cost effectively. What I mean by cost effectively is that, assuming you have a building, that the facility condition index of that building is saying that that building should what? Be demolished. The building is an asset. But how do you demolish that building? A test story building, what does it entail? What cost will it cost you to bring that building down? And this has to be what? Done at the what? What? A good cost effective. So life cycle of an asset. This I've already mentioned. You can see it started with on design, on construction. And when you are talking about design and construction, you talk about drawing. You drawing uh, specs, you take permit to carry out the con uh, construction work. You award the contract, you schedule the contract, you start the process of, then you maintain standard. Then when the project is being delivered, you start talking about how do you update the, uh, how do you update the building? You use your drawing as build drawing. You talk about your standard operating procedure with your SOP, your permit to operate, the contract, operation and maintenance, what are the manpower that you require, resources and all the, all the other things. Then you start talking about repair. What are the kind of repair you carry out? Your maintenance, your upgrade, and when the building is already due for retirement, you need to demolish the building. It comes at the cost. This is what they mean by life cycle of what? An asset. Then what are asset strategy? You have an asset you are maintaining. What are the strategies you need to put in place? And when we're talking about strategy, whatsoever strategy you have put in place, to maintain an asset, it must be in line with the company policy. It must be in line with the company watch strategy, the company overall company goal, overall company objective. It must be in tune with your company strategic goal. So what is strategy? This, your uh, asset management strategy should what? Provide a better understanding of how to align the asset to what? To a portfolio. Then two, it must also so that it is the best, it must best meet the service delivery need of the organization, both in the present and in the future to come. So it must be able to deliver both as at current and in the nearest future. Then it must be able to enable the organization asset management policy to be what achieved. So whatever strategy you are put in place, it must be smart strategy. It must be simple, it must be measurable. It must be achievable, it must be what? Reliable and must be what? Smart. So it's more, your policy must be what? It must be smart. Whatever asset management strategy you want to like employ must be, it must provide better understanding of how to align the asset to what? To portfolio. Then two, it must meet the service delivery need of the organization, both the current one and in the future to come. And number three, it must enable the organization asset management policy to be what? It must be achieved. Then when you are developing asset management policy or strategy, you must first get a clear understanding of the current situation of the asset. What is the current situation of the asset? And that means you need to carry out what we call asset audit. And that is the reason why it is always required of you as a facility manager when you are taking up a new facility, you need to conduct what we call facility condition assessment. Uh, it is during the facility condition assessment, you pick every asset in that facility one by one and itemize what are their current conditions. So that, and the reason why you are doing this is that you don't want to take over what we call liability. You don't want to take over what we call backlog of maintenance because possibly the people that have been maintaining the facility before, they have a lot of bad luck in terms of maintenance they're supposed to have carried out, which either either through negligence or unavailability of money, or one way or the other, something has hindered them from carrying out that maintenance activity. And if you don't conduct what we call asset condition assessment, you might be taking up a liability that somebody else has what? Let. So you get a clear understanding of the current situation of the asset. One, what is the condition of the asset? Does the asset meet the current, current and future need of your organization? Is the fund 
funding base for operation maintenance and renewal appropriate or affordable? Do you have the cost? Do you have the money? Do you have the capital to fund the operation of that asset, to maintain that asset? And even if there is need for a renewal, do you have the capital base? Or is it affordable to spend money on that asset? With all this thing you have done, you will be able to make a vital decision, a strategic decision, either to take up the asset or not to take up the asset maintenance. Now, when you are using a life cycle approach on asset management, you have what you call asset planning decision. And when you are doing asset planning decision, you do what we call developing an asset management policy. And when you are developing asset management policy, what is asset management policy? It is an integrated and multidisciplinary approach to recommend, approach is recommended while developing the policy. Why is it multidisciplinary? When you are designing that policy, it is not a policy that you as a facility manager can take alone. And you remember that I said, you need to conduct what we call asset, uh, an asset audit. When you are doing asset assessment, condition assessment, it is a more disciplinary in the sense that it could require you, you it could require your presence as a facility manager. You could need the service of a structural engineer, possibly if it's an estate, where you have an estate of a 10 story or 20 story building. You could need the service of a structural engineer to test the integrity of the building. You could need the service of an architect to redesign. You could need the service of a fire service man. You could need the service of an MEP. An MEP engineer is more or less like a mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineer who can ascertain the current condition of those plumbing systems. You know, in your building system, you have in your building system, you have the roofing system, you have the plumbing system, you have the electrical system, you have your communication system, you have your transportation system. You might need experts in this area who will assess the building for you and submit their report. It is based on the report you'll be able to form your own policy. And that is the reason why it is termed, they said, it is an integrated and multidisciplinary approach. And it's recommended why you are developing a policy clear direction of the asset management, the reason why you do that. Then two, to ensure service delivery need from the basis of asset manager, management. Then three, a life cycle approach incorporated to our world, asset management. Then four, part of what you stand to gain is what you call sustainability. Because when you conduct assess condition assessment, you know the condition of the asset. You know if you have enough capital to work, take up that asset. And you'll be able to determine if that asset is what is maintainable. And if it is maintainable, is that asset also what sustainable? So what is the benefits of strategic approach to asset management? The first benefit is that better allocation of resources. How do you do that? When you have already conducted your assets, uh, asset assessment and you know the condition of your asset, you'll be able to determine what is the right manpower you need to deploy? What is the number of manpower you need to deploy? What is going to be the, your cost of manpower? Then the other benefit you are going to enjoy is that you have improved alignment of assets with service and organizational expectation. You'll be able to align the service of the asset towards the organization goal. Then you stand the better integration of service planning and what? Asset planning. Then number four, improve process and accountability for capital and recurrent work. Then more effective use and maintenance of what? Of your assets. These are what you stand to gain. And these are all the benefits of your what? Strategic approach towards asset management. How your asset register could be costing you. If you don't maintain an a asset register, and your asset register tells you, it gives you the detail about your asset in terms of the name of the asset, the serial number, the model number, the maker, the life cycle of the, uh, the number of year, the expected life, uh, life expectancy of that asset. 
the commissioning date, what is the salary status of that asset? And according to asset management resources, nearly every company has a problem with lost assets, estimating that are on the average of almost about 10 to 30% of assets are in fact lost assets. When you are not tracking your assets, when you don't maintain an asset register for your assets, you stand the chance to lose 30, 10 to 30% of your assets because there is no how you won't have what we call ghost assets. And ghost asset means you still have assets on your record, but physically that asset is no longer available. Lost asset. What is a lost asset? An asset that has been stolen is a lost asset. It's stolen or it's no longer what? Usable. But still appear on the company asset register. Also referred to as what? Ghost asset. And what is the danger of ghost asset? Inaccurate balance sheet is going to affect your accounting procedure and accounting processes because you'll be having, you be you'll be putting the depreciation value in your account, in your balance sheet, in which that asset is no longer what available. Then two, loss of productivity. You are adding what expenses, then inaccurate capex cap budgeting. Asset misappropriation, what fraud. At the end of every year, you are budgeting money for the maintenance of asset that is not what what physically what available. These are all what you stand to what to lose when you have your asset not being tracked properly and not being monitored properly. And that brings us to what we call asset register. One, what is an asset register? A record that clearly identifies all, all the assets of a business. That is what an asset register is. And two, it also allows business owner to quickly retrieve information on that asset. It is easier for you to know how much you have expended on the particular asset. And it is economically advisable that when the cost of maintenance of an asset is equivalent, is almost equal to the current value of replacing it, it is economically necessary to replace that asset with what? With a new one instead of continue spending of money. For instance, let me take a pumping machine in your water treatment plant for that as an example. If you don't replace, if cost of rewinding that pumping machine is more or less becoming the cost of replacing it, I think, I think it is economically value, uh, valid that you buy a new pumping machine that still is, you still have one or two, three or four months warranty on it and it's still going to serve you rather than doing a concurrent uh, recording of that, the coil of that pumping machine, or today the shaft is bad, tomorrow the impeller is bad, next tomorrow you have to what, rewind it again. And this comes what, at the cost, apart from the fact that you are losing production time. Then it shows the asset value, date of acquisition, and other details to compute for depreciation and what tax purpose. And every accounting person will understand what they mean by tax purposes in terms of asset management. It also allows you to keep track record of assets and provide fair estimate of what the worth of that particular asset. That is what your asset register does for you. And it, as a facility manager, when you are joining an organization, if that organization doesn't have what to call an asset register, it is expected of you professionally for you to develop one for all the assets in that facility. And if that facility has already existing asset register. You can continue to build on it as time goes on. An why does an organization need an, a, an asset register? One, an organization need an asset register to process the process of asset in accordance with the organization authorization and record keeping procedure. So like the example that I gave the other time that for instance, for a, a pumping machine, every, every manager will want to listen to you when you tell your manager that, sir, we have spent the total cost of repair we have expended on this pumping machine is over 50,000 euros. I think it is better we replace it with a new one. Every manager will be very, very willing to listen to you because you are coming with a quote, with a fact, with a fact and figure. That is different between when you walk up to your manager and you say, sir, my technician said we need to buy a new pumping machine. Why do we need to buy a, pump, a new pumping machine? That one is no longer good again. What has happened to it? You can't defend it. But when you have your facts and figures at hand, you can immediately convince your manager the reason why 
you need to buy a new one. But let the management now take a decision so that, sorry, we can't buy now. Let's go ahead with repair because our current budget cannot, cannot provide us with that opportunity of course, acquiring a new pumping machine. That is, you know that that is definitely a decision from the management side. So it can guide as a process during the purchase of an asset in accordance with what organizing authorization and what record keeping what procedure. Maintaining it also help an organization to maintain an adequate accounting record of asset cost, asset description, and where they are kept in the organization. So you know where your asset is per uh, what per time. And that's the reason why it's required. Well, when you are transferring an asset from Lagos to your other facility in Abuja, the asset register that you open for that asset must leave Lagos and go alongside with that asset to Abuja. Not that when the asset gets to Abuja, you have to reopen another asset register for it. No. The current one you are maintaining must go from there to what? It's just like a doctor maintaining your uh, record file, your medical file. So if you want to leave the hospital, it is always required you can request for your medical file. So that asset register must go alongside with that asset to the new world, new location. Then it also helps an organization to maintain accurate record for what? Depreciation. It also helps the organization to provide management with information to help plan for future asset investment. So you can plan maybe in the nearest few years, we need to create or revamp this our facility. Or in the next three years, we need to change our generator. Or in the next 10 to 20 years, we need to buy another transformer for our facility. Then also, it's also helps okay, an organization to get Please, can you please help us uh, to mute you? Please, can you help us to mute you, Mr. Jackson? Sorry. Yeah, please, please, Thank you very much. So what are the types of physical assets that need to be recorded include your office equipment. Uh, what are those your office equipment? Your computer, your chairs, your what? water dispenser, your tables, your electric fan, if you have, your motor vehicles, your furniture, your computer, your communication system, and your equipment. These are all your water boiler in the office is an asset because these are not something that you change every month. Your microwave oven that you use in your pantry is an asset. It must enter your asset register book. So what is the purpose of an asset register? One, it helps to keep a record of the company asset, their respective value and attributes. Two, to simplify record keeping. Then three, the register becomes a reference for business decision. Then four, it can also be used for depreciation purposes. Then five, it can also help you to verify the existence of all assets. Then to keep a master list of what is held and where they're being held. These are all the purpose of what your asset register. So when you want to create an asset register, how do you go by it? One, you decide and confirm the purpose of the asset register. Then two, what is the method of organizing your asset register? Let's take 1004 estate for an, for an example. You have several numbers of block of flats. So you can say block one, flat one. So it all depends on how you want to uh, uh, arrange it. You can decide on your arrangement by yourself. Then you can identify. Then next is you identify asset by performing what you call fiscal audit, which I've earlier mentioned. So it could be walk around, it could be walk through, it could be crawl through. Then you create an account record for each of the assets. Every single asset in that facility must have what you call asset register. Then you conduct periodic audit to verify the accuracy of the word asset register. So these are all, these are little, and um, let me also tell you that there is no any generic or there is no any uh, international standard or any international format in terms of asset register. You can create your, your own by yourself, but there is a soft, uh, a soft copy that has already been designed uh that um baraka will be like sending to all of us 
but you can improve on it. It's more or less like a, a just like an example that you can upgrade on. But the output, what you actually want to achieve will determine what is going to form all your uh, the edits of your asset register. And what are those fact, uh, those points that you can find in asset register? The name of the asset, the capacity of the asset, for instance, your air condition, is it two horsepower AC? Is it one horsepower? Is it, if it is one horsepower? Is it split unit? Is it free floor standing? Your generator, is it 200 kVA? Is it 1000 kVA? Your pumping machine, your furniture fitting, your uh, television in the office, are these 46 inches? Are they uh, 50 inches? These are all your model number, your serial number, the location of the asset, the condition of the asset. Is this thing in good condition? The purchase price, the date of purchase, or date of commissioning, asset manufacturer, who manufactured the asset. Is it LG? Is it iSense? Then asset description, insurance coverage. Do we have an insurance coverage on the asset? What is the warranty status, warranty information? The date asset placed in service, the date of commissioning, estimated life, life of the asset, then salvage value, and assigned asset identification number. Then most of the time, at times, you can pick up the estimated life of an asset from an account or uh, an accountant because they use that one to determine the depreciation value of that asset, the cost of the asset, and the expected lifespan of that asset. That is what they use to determine what will be the depreciation value um, of that asset, the amount of money they be depreciating every month that goes to your what? Your accounting um, system. So asset Please just unmute yourself. Let me know if you I can. Yes. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. So welcome back from the short break. So let's now mute ourselves, spending the time for um, question and answer. Asset, asset tag integration. Now, God are those days when we do physical asset counting. But at times, if your the the let me say let me use the word robust. It, it all depends on how robust your asset is or how voluminous your asset is. That is what you determine if you are going to use asset tagging or integration. There are some places where you can still stick to your normal physical counting and every other thing. Because if you want to go um, software based. The management will definitely want to know the reason why you want to spend a huge amount of money. Why do you want to? What has happened to the one we're using? And if you can defend it very well, they might not eventually keen to it. But asset tagging is very, very important. It saves you a lot of time instead of counting assets one by one. You can use your barcode scan to scan your asset and. So asset tagging, asset tag integration require big data and machine. Big data is machine to machine, it's cost performance association, then labor improvement because it saves you a lot of manpower, then supplies allocation, then older tagging systems, static data, newer system are more dynamic. So you can easily upgrade your old tagging towards new tagging system. And these are all Tagging, asset tagging that you can use. If you are using alpha numeric tagging, you can use, it's a one way. It is asset type. It, is, it can only talk about asset type, location, the asset number, and you have to manually enter it into the machine. Then when you are using barcode tagging, that is also one way. And that will only take care of your asset type, the location of the asset, the number, the asset number. But the only difference between the alpha numeric and barcode is that Alpha numeric is manual, is manually entered, not like analog, but your barcode is what is automated. So if you use your RFID tag, it is dynamic two way. It is it's take care of your asset type, take care of your location of the asset, the asset number. It is automated and it is special reading what you can use special reading devices. So you can use your then your QR code tagging. It's two way dynamic. It is asset type. It tells you about asset type, the location, your asset number, your automated, it is automated, and it is smartphone. 
So that means it can be linked with your, your mobile phone and it is customer accessibility. So these are all example of asset tagging that you can use. So whichever one you want will determine which one you are going to pick. So the output that you want to generate will determine whichever one out of this one you are going to choose for your what? For your asset labeling. Then asset tagging, these are all, this is your example of your scanning, this is your uh, barcode scanning, this is your RFID, this is also your barcode for scanning. So storage and retrieval of method. Because your asset plays a vital role and it is very, very key, it helps you in making some key business decisions. The information you generate on your asset are information that are vital to you that you don't want to lose. Organization can face huge risk when assets are operated without asset information. In many organizations, keeping accurate detail of assets is an ongoing challenge. This is compounded by assets often being situated at different ge geographical locations. In situation whereby you have a message you are man man managing in Lagos, you have one in Maiduguri, you have one in Ibadan, so you have several numbers of estates you are managing throughout the whole country. So maintaining your asset could be very bogus. And in this kind of situation, you can key into maintaining your asset in terms of software base. So poor recording of changes, maybe one asset is being moved from Lagos to Abuja or from Abuja to Lagos or from Ibadan to Akure, and it's not being properly documented. Because when you are using physical method, you, those ones are prone to what? Human error. And you have to like physically count the asset, get the detail of the asset, and manually enter it into either your Excel spreadsheet or whatever. I can still hear some background noise. Can you please hear what you mean? Then, out of date asset register a poor definition of what constitutes a physical asset. So at times, when we go, don't put a detailed definition of that asset, that can also affect our what? Information retrieval from the asset content. So what are the process of asset tagging? One, you identify the business protocol. 10, select the tagging system or QR label that you want to use. Then three, inventory of the asset. Then for select the asset name, you can decide which other, whichever name you want to call the asset. Assign each asset with a unique string. Unique string means you have an asset in Lagos, you can use LA. You have an asset in Abuja, you can use AB. You have an asset in Portaco, you can use PH as the first what asset uh, string, unique string. You can use PH for the other asset. Let's assume you have a generator in Portaco. You can use PH. J E N O O one. That is, you are talking about Portacot as is as it as is at the name of the location. Then the name of the asset is generator. The number of the asset is number zero 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 one. So just on like that. Then you can classify all your generator in terms of power. You can use P W as power slash P H Portacot slash J slash the size of that generator 20 kva slash 001 so here you know that when you are talking about that particular asset you are talking about you have power when you want to look for assets that are power related you go into power slot so you can use that for power then the one in lagos you can use early you can use power slash early slash gen slash 20 kva slash 003 so you are the one that will determine the unit string you're going to want to use for asset. So example, the business unit, the country, the city, the building number, the building floor, the room, and this STM code, our asset number. These are what you can use to assign a unit string to your, to your asset when you are tagging your asset. Then standardization, what, why is it important? Example, STM uniform level format. And most of the equipment come, always come with the ITM. And that ITM, you can use your barcode to scan that word, that format. Then your A stack, your ISO 267, then your data integration, your skill uh, portability, then efficient benchmarking. 
these are all the standard that you need to use when you are using your word when you are developing your word asset register then documentation what are those documentation as operation and maintenance manual most of the time when we install new equipment we facility managers are always fond of the, of the fact that we may always misplace or we throw away the manual or the whatever that comes with the equipment even ordinary standing fan the manual could be very very useful so when you uncreate a new equipment as a facility manager the first thing that you always look for is the equipment manual you must document it because in the equipment manual you can draw up the maintenance schedule for that particular equipment there are a lot of vital information that manufacturer can put inside that manual that are very going to be very very useful for you in the nearest future in terms of operation and maintenance of that asset then warranty terms it is always embedded inside your equipment manuals then as built drawing there is a difference between um your engineering drawing and as built drawing you get the engineering drawing before the beginning of the contract or before the beginning of the building project but as built diagram come after the building has already been constructed the engineering drawing we only tell you where to install pillar where they should, there should be a beam but along the line there could be a change the as built drawing we entail all the changes that are taking place during the construction period and that's the reason why it is very very key at the expiration of every project you must request for the as built drawing before you make the final payment for that project it is very very key please take it because the as built drawing is what you are going to be using in the nearest future when there is anything any problem as regard mep mechanical electrical and plumbing on that building project as build drawing your asset master list your asset tagging your repair history these are all documentation that will help you in terms of our asset register which is very very key so proper disposal of an asset even when you want to dispose your assets most especially if you happen to be a facility manager in a chemical industry you can't just dispose your chemical anyhow you have to have get an expert who is going to handle that for you proper disposal of an asset what is asset disposal plan a plan that documents the activity and costs associated with disposal of an asset assuming let's take 1004 estates as an example if we are to demolish all the building in 1004 you should know that definitely it is not something that we can just gather some malam from nearby area and ask them to bring ama and chizu and start breaking down the building no it involves us getting an expert and this might require us getting even an approval from legal state government and we might need to get some legal approvals as well it might require us getting a fire brigade approach to be on standby we have ambulance to be on standby we have hsc people to be on ground this i this is a plan that document the activity and costs associated with what disposal of an asset generally part of what comprehensive asset management plan then any activity associated with the disposal of a decommissioning asset such as the sale of an asset before you sell an asset it's going to require you to invite an architect it's going to require you to invite a mechanic before for instance you want to you want to dispose of one of your fleet car like let me assume like three or four cars within this uh, facility you want to dispose them of it might require you a time to call your mechanic to come and assess those vehicles and tell you what is the value of this fleet in the market so that you can still use that one to generate some money back to what to the company then demolition which i've already mentioned relocation these are all that come at the cost and asset disposal plan should include forecast of the timing for future asset disposal one then two cash flow forecast identify income and expenditure associated with what the asset will this asset yield money back to the company if the answer is yes at how much will that money be are we the one that we need to spend money to dispose this asset just like if you want to dispose 1004 estate 
you should know that the company is the one disposing what spending money it comes as an expense but when we are selling company cars that the book value has become zero the company car is the one that is caught generating money back into the company so we have inflow of uh, money so then we need to also determine the time asset time asset disposal to ensure that the placement assets are operational so that when you are taking an old asset out you must ensure that the one you are bringing in will serve the purpose and also serve beyond the purpose of the initial one not that you are bringing in an asset that is not even that cannot even perform up to what the initial asset is performing for instance if you are a facility manager in an it industry you want to replace your uh your uh your router you shouldn't bring a router that we perform less than what the initial router is performing. You should make sure that the new router you are getting is giving a fast information compared to the initial one. So the, the new asset must be ready to absorb the workload of the decommission asset. So the workload of that other asset that you are disposing, the new one you are putting in place, must be able to perform that task and perform beyond that. And at the same time, it must be user friendly so that users are not inconvenient needlessly. So asset disposal plan is an important component of a sound asset management plan. Same, dis same disposal cost can be as much as 5% or the full life cycle cost of an asset. So you must do your disposal plan accurately so that at the end of the day, you don't put end users what, in problem. When you are replacing an asset, what is replacement cost or value? The amount of money to pay to replace an asset at the present time according to its what, current worth. So understanding replacement cost, a certain asset approach the end of their useful life, expenditure to replace the asset need to be what, anticipated. Explore insurance coverage for the asset, just like I've mentioned initially that when you want to demolish a building, it might require you to take some legal approval. It might require you to take some state government approval, and it might require you to take some um, health and safety commission approval. So do you need insurance coverage for that period in time? If you are disposing of a chemical, what is the hazardous nature of that chemical to human health? So you might need to take some insurance policy coverage for those who are taking, who are doing what, who are disposing of that asset. All this come at a cost, and you need to plan this ahead of that disposal. So computer-based asset monitoring. Currently now, there are a lot of computer-based asset monitoring that are coming up. So assets are a critical component of any business or organization. But asset tracking, but tracking those assets can be one of the most time-consuming tasks of the entire workday. So what are those computer-based monitoring you can use? Barcode, asset tracking tool. One, when you are using barcode, it will streamline your work. Then two, it will help make employee work more efficiently and productively. Then asset tracking tools. When you are using asset tracking tool, it enables organization to track asset, man asset maintenance and location. It saves value time and eliminates the need for what, spreadsheet. It ensures proper inventory of what the asset management. So you'll be able to what, have what a detailed inventory of your, of your assets. That is one of the advantage you gain when you are using a computer-based asset monitoring. So asset tracking system speed up audit tasks and conduct asset tracking in real time. So instead of you doing physical accounting one by one, you start, you save a lot of time when you are using asset tracking system. This enables more efficient in planning. It enables scheduling of necessary maintenance or service for equipment at appropriate time. These are all the advantages of using a computer-based asset monitoring system. So when you are setting up an asset tracking, what are the factors you need to consider? How many assets do you need to track? One. Then two, what type of asset are you tracking? What is the criticality of that asset to the company? Is it a critical asset? Is it a minor asset? Is it a semi-minor asset? Is it a major asset to the company? These are the questions that you need to like consider before that will determine the type of asset and uh, tracking system you are going to put in place. Where are those assets located? How many locations do you have? Are these assets already labeled? 
Will you use barcode or RFID tags? Do you need real time updates or can batch code collection be used? What type of reporting will you need for, from that system? So the report that you need will form the type of software system you are going to put in place. Then if you are more or less like a facility manager, you maintain several numbers of ORIG. You have several numbers of location. They are not in one single location. You can do what we call real time updates. I use that one to collect your what? To collect your data. So you have computer aided facility management system and you have internet facility management software. So there are several software that you can use to manage space management, do real time real estate and property management. There are software that can perform your facility assessment for you. There are software that can perform your maintenance and operation. When you are talking about CMMS, that is computer aided uh, um, um, computer, computer aided maintenance management system. Then you have your CAG, that is computer aided design in terms of architectural design. You have building automation and energy management software. There are several numbers of software that can perform all these tasks for you. But the output that you want to generate, the information that you need from the software will determine the type of software you can use. There are several numbers of software that can perform CF CMMS operation for you. But the information you actually want to code out from that software we determine then what is the cost of that software? What, what are the uh, after sales service that you are going to gain from that software? What is the warranty status of that software? Then you can do networking. You can ask some other facility manager who has used this facility, who has used this software before. What are the uh, challenges they are having with that software? How is that software performing for them? These are all information you can gather that will inform your decision about choosing that particular software. So you can see in the markets of software, there are several numbers of software that can perform your space and asset management for you. There are software that can perform your real estate and property management, facility assessment, maintenance and operation, buildings management system, your computer aided design, and construction system. There are several numbers of software that you can use that can perform those tasks. But what we inform your decision about that software is the information you are trying to put out, the output you are trying to generate from that software is what will determine what you want to use that software for. Then the cost of that software to your company, then the after sales service, then how many, what are the period that we take you to integrate that system into your system? These are factors that you're going to determine if you are going to pick up a software or to pick up another alternative option. So when you are implementing your uh, facility management system, before the implementation, what do you need to do? One, as you must assess the, what you must assess the asset by their business need. What is the need of that asset to the business? Is it a critical need? Is it a major need? Is it a minor need? Is it a semi-minor need? Then decide on system implementation objective. Identify system requirements. What will be done with the information from the system? The information you want to generate play a vital role, a critical role in informing the type of software you are going to use. Proceed with the purchase of the software. Finally, implement the system. And when you implement the system, during implementation period, you must draw up what you call implementation plan. Then issue identification, risk management. What are the risks? What are the number of working hours you are going to lose? What are the number of production hours you're going to lose? Who are the end user that that implementation are going to affect? If it's an internet integration, uh, can you get a, uh, a an internet that people can use at all? That may possibly maybe during that integration period, they have to be working from home because there won't be internet in the office. What are the risks that involve? You want to then change management. You have to manage that change during that period in time. Some people have to leave office. Some people have to manage their office. Then the transition period. How many period? How many days will it take you? 
Is it a transition period that will take like a month? Is it two month period? Or if service provider tells you it is two months, can you streamline this to like maybe 45 days? Is 45 days tenable? Then you need to review the implementation before you start. When you have draw up the implementation processes, you review it again, review it again, and review it again until when you know that, fine, you know that that implementation process will actually work. Then you can key into it, you can start it. Then after implementation, these are tasks you need to carry out. One, you need to continue the process, monitoring the process and tweaking. You must continue monitoring the process because you can't just implement and stay off. No. Does it require you to continue staff training and retraining and retraining until when everybody gets used to that new system? Then the other thing is that quality assurance, do you conduct, you need to keep conducting quality assurance on the input that goes into the software. Then you need to continue promoting the software value to the staff. Every point user needs to know the reason why you are integrating them on new software. Otherwise, that software will be dead on arrival. You need to keep you need to keep telling them the value and what do they stand to gain in using that software. Now, the bottom line here is that the facility management system aren't just about the software. Every staff should be made to see the value of the system and hence an organization should put everything in place to ensure the system is used effectively. Can you help us mount yourself, Mr. Francis? Please, we can hear your background noise. Thank you very much. So, you must, after implementation of that system, you must keep training people. You must ensure you are monitoring the process. You must ensure you conduct what they are actually putting in as input into that system. Then, Every staff must know the value of that system. Otherwise, that system is dead on an arrival. So what is the benefit of CMMS? Computer, computer maintenance management system, computerized maintenance management system, that is CMMS. One, it helps you to effectively plan and schedule your preventing maintenance. Two, it helps you to manage work order effect efficiently. It generates the work order uh, digitally and send the signal to the concerned person. And you can even on the real time get an approval in terms on what digitally. But it's also only that you cannot carry out the task digitally. It has to be what physically what carried out. Then you can manage your spare part inventory. You can eliminate paperwork, enhance productivity, reduce that time and repair costs. Repair costs increase and increases safety. Keep a finger on the pulse of your organization. Ensure compliance with what regulatory standard. Then it increases your productivity. It also ensure your equipment have what we call life, longer lifetime. Then once you have what you call reduced downtime, definitely you are going to have a greater uptime. So you have less uptime you have good productivity and you have increase in production volume. So when you are implementing com uh, computerized maintenance management system, the first thing you need to ensure is that you need to get buy, you need to buy in, get buy in and commitment from what management. You need because if you don't get management approval, you can get that one implemented. Define the required requirement including the goal expectation, hardware, and timelines. Gather a list of all assets to be entered into what? The CMMS, into the software. Document all your plan, preventing maintenance procedure. Select the CMMS software that suits your need. Not just all CMMS will, report, will meet up with your requirements. You only need to pick up the one that meet up with your requirement. Import any data you have you have from the existing system using what spreadsheet 
you have to import from the analog you are using before to the new software. Hard user and user group to the same image. Who are the people that will have access to the current software? It's not something that every decanary will just be putting hand into. It could be the overall facility head, the finance manager, the uh, facility manager, and facility supervisor. Then, add your asset to the CMMS. When you do, after you have done that, hard schedule maintenance and set triggers. Then, once that is that is done, you can go live. You can come down to what your real time. Day. Then, what are the phase that? What are the steps? When you are implementing your computer and your maintenance system, then you plan the project one, you migrate the data from the old data to the new, the new software you have. You configure the new system. You process the design. You do test practical, you practicalize it. And when you practicalize it, just like when you install your printer, you put it to test, you test, you do some printing test. That is, you practicalize it then, Whatever the result that you are getting from that system, you have to work, manage it properly because those information are very, very vital because you need those information to make strategic business decisions. What are the challenges you encounter when you are implementing computer, computerized maintenance management system? Features and function are one of the challenges you are going to face. System flexibility, interface capability, system security and data security these are all the challenges you will definitely encounter when you're implementing a facility management system and what is the difference between computer aided facility management and other facility management system one not to confuse a computerized maintenance management system cmm and computer aided facility management don't confuse them with each other. Your CMMS is just a son or daughter to computer-aided facility management system. CAFM, Mr. Suleiman. Oh, Barakat, please. Can you please help us mute your, yourself? Thank you. So, as I was saying, your computer computerized maintenance management system is a subset of computer aided facility management. It is under computer aided facility management. CFM is under it. They are not the same thing. CFM is just like a father. Why CFM is just like a son under CFM? So let's consider a real life example. An office in the workplace ensure that the office is properly inspected, maintained, repaired. If this is a core computerized maintenance management system activity. But when you are talking about the knowledge about the staff and the office content, which include the chairs, the table, the locker, the desk, the phone, including their movement from one office to the another office, and the equipment connection, which include electrical, oxygen communicating, communication system, these are all related under computer, computerized aided facility management system. So don't let us mix the two together. They are two different things. One is talking about the overall, the overall um, system of a facility. Why Tom is just taking maintenance activity of the facility alone? So that brings us to the end of asset management today. And after this, we have an assessment which we are to answer and submit. I'm so sure we have a means of submission. So, but before we call it a day, uh, we try to entertain like five questions. So you can just signify by raising up your hand, um, call your name, you unmute yourself and you answer your question, then I provide an answer. Mr. Alua Toyin Emmanuel, go ahead, unmute yourself and present your question. Oh, good evening, Mr. Emmanuel. Thank you very much for the... I... Okay, I am Uluwa Yomi. 
Oh, Mr. Oluwa, you mean sorry. Thank Mano. you very much. Yeah, actually, I've been looking forward for this assessment of a thing, for this, sorry, for this asset management of a thing. And in your teachings, I really enjoyed it too. But the question I have is this, where we started, we talked about uh, updating an asset register. Yes, sir. So that uh, in case it gets uh, spoiled, so maybe after they spent some money on the, maybe for instance, generator now, they spent some yeah. money and you can just tell your mind that, sir, please, we need to change this. We need to change this. We need to replace it with a new one. But on yes, the assets register, I is there a place where we can put this expenditure, all these small small expenses on the on the equipment we are trying, we are repairing. So when we call for replacement, as in, is there a place we are logging it on the register on the assets? Your asset register must have a column for repair and maintenance. Oh, okay, because that's good. And that's the reason why at times some people call it history card. Call it what? History card. History card. History. Okay, history card. Okay. History card. So it gives you the history of everything that is, has happened to that particular equipment. So, like um, what I do in my former company where I worked before, um, I maintain that centrally in my office. And once you are coming with any weapon Nigeria, we do our payment centrally at the head office. So once any repair has been carried out on any equipment, there is something that we call a job completion form. So every vendor collects a job completion form from wherever any of our location where you carry out a repair work. And once you come to that head office, you submit. My help desk uh, um, personnel knows that before he brings that um, invoice to my table, you need to first of all record it inside the history card alongside with the amount and everything. And we bring a copy of that history card alongside with the invoice. So I will sign both the invoice and I will sign the history card at the same time. I do that to make sure I ensure every cost expended on every equipment goes into the history card. And when I wanted to make any replacement, I just bring out the history card, take all the expenses on that equipment, put it in an Excel format and get the final total and presented it to the, my senior boss who give an approval. Or he also tell me, let's hold on, let's still maintain, let's do one or two repair work, pending where we are going to put it in our budget so that we can get it done. That is one of the advantage of your asset register. And at the same time, you know where your asset is per time and what is the condition of that your asset at a particular period in time. So Mr. I hope that answer your question, sir. Yes, it answered it. It answered it very well, but there's some okay, it answered it. Thank you very much. Okay. No, if you have another question, you can bring it up, please. No, because I think it's not on the okay, like the history card now is not in the asset register. It's separate that okay, well, this history is on this machine, for instance, it's on this generator. So anytime <laughs> I have anything, I can refer to the history card, right? Not that it's on the code, yeah, not that yeah, it's a particular. Oh, that's what I want to hear. Thank you. You can to the district card, yes. Okay, not that there's a column because I was thinking if we have a column no, in the asset register. register you can, for your asset register, you can create a column for it. So, for instance, if we are you making, know, for instance, know, repair like five times now, won't it be voluminous? What you are trying to track is cost. Yes. And at the same time, try to understand the fact that you don't do repair work on a month, on a daily basis on some certain equipment. Yes. So that's the reason why, because your asset register, you are made, you are taking the list of every asset in the company one by one. Yes. So today you might carry out a repair work on AC number 10. Hmm. Then next month, it might be AC number three. Okay. So. It is only when you have consistency of consistency of repair on one particular yes, or maybe it's the number ten ringing bell. And if you have not been tracking, you won't know. Okay. So, so let me pick up Mr. Bumi uh, Oh, I think Miss, <laughs> right? Yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Ma, sorry, ma. It's okay. Part of it for the second time, ma. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, ma. Yeah. Um. Thank you for um all you have shared so far. 
while you were talking in um, tagging system, you talked about um, a kind of food that has it that is dynamic and two way. Yeah. In what way is it two way? Well, how is it different from the one way? I don't understand that. Then in the tagging process, you said identify business protocol. What protocol in particular are we supposed to identify? I don't understand. I'm trying to ask. You know, when you want okay. to tag, you need to understand what is your business protocols and processes. That is what is telling you because whatsoever you want to do must be in line with the business process policies and protocols. What so, other word can we use for protocols? You can use your business policies as well. Okay. It's okay. Okay. Then the two way, the two way dynamic to what? What makes it two way? You know, like I earlier said earlier on, like this, your RFID can take your reading in two way. Your QR code tag can take your reading in two way, but your barcode scanning can only be one way. You can only scan one way. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what makes it two way. What makes it one way? I don't know. If you if you look I'm at not, it, like, okay, you are not you are not yet. What I'm saying is that I've not. Uh, Apart from maybe using a barcode on my phone, I've not used for. If you are using barcode, on your, you know, if you are using barcode on your phone, yes. you can always scan the barcode. Yes. But there are some of these systems that they can scan both the barcode and also scan your uh, numeric tagging. You know, most of the equipment always come with uh, eleven uh, eleven digit uh, numeric tagging. Mm. Yeah. There are some of these uh, systems that can do that can do both. Okay. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay, Mr. Afis. Mr. Afis. Hello, sir. Yeah, Mr. Afis, go ahead, sir. Am I audible? Okay. Yeah, um, very, very audible. Okay, my question is this, sir. Yes, sir. Um, is there any time frame for the dispo for disposal disposal of assets? Because yes, during sir. the course of during the course of learning, sir, yes, sir. you were mentioning the relationship um, between the asset the asset manager and um, the facility manager as regards disposal of assets. Yes. Let me bring a small scenario, sir. Okay, I sir. once worked in a, I once worked in a place whereby they dispose uh, motor vehicles at a particular time, and um, what they do is that when there are motor vehicles that are that are that I think the lifespan has been um, has been used, they go dump these vehicles somewhere, and then wait for a very long time before disposal takes place. So. My question now is that I know that I also know that in accounting, um, the period of depreciation of an asset is four, four to five years. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, as a facility manager, sir, when am I supposed to recommend a, 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 an asset for disposal after its uh, life cycle has been um, has expired? Okay. Let me let, let me come in in that um, in that aspect. Let's take a, a generator. Let's assume you have an estate in Nigeria and you have an estate in uh, Ghana that you are maintaining. If you want to assign life expectancy, which one will you give the highest life expectancy? Nigeria or Ghana? Uh, is well, uh, it, Nigeria is the only place I know, sir. I would say Nigeria because I don't know how. Okay. You know the reason why I'm saying that is this. The reason why yes, I'm saying that is this. It's just like you are currently in Nigeria now, and yeah. you are assigning a 10 years lifespan to a generator, yeah. which you know that that is not visible in Nigeria. Yeah. If you assign that, 
an accountant will pick up what you have assigned as a 10 years. And it will use that to determine the depreciation value of that um, generator. But yeah. going by Nigeria factor where there is non-availability of power, where yeah. you use generator, you use electricity as a standby for generator. Yeah. You know that that generator cannot use a lifespan of 10 years, not possible. Yeah. So what we actually inform you, inform your knowledge about the lifespan you are going to assign to that generator is the environmental factor, which is Nigeria. So to mm. me, if I'm going to assign life expectancy for that generator, I will assign just mm. only five years. Okay. If I want to assign life expectancy for a transformer, I can give a transformer 20 years. If okay. you sell a very good power transformer, your transformer can last 20 years. Okay. Then it's just like you buy a pumping machine. For your water treatment plant, and you are not giving that uh, pumping machine 20 years lifespan. You know, it's not possible. You buy an air condition and you are assigning 10 years to that air condition. You know, it's not possible. It's not, it's not achievable. But you have, if you are still giving an air condition six, seven years, it's possible if you put a very good maintenance activities in place. Okay. So your experience about assets networking for people who has one way or the other used that kind of asset before we inform the number of years you are going to assign to an asset you can't buy a computer today and assign 20 years for that computer you know it's not tenable okay, okay. then you buy a furniture okay. and you assign 20 years you know it's not tenable even if that chair is still good the bottom line is that aesthetically it might not be meeting up the standard of what your environment requires. It's just like, you know, 20 years ago, me and you can still go to a party and sit down on an iron chair. Those ones that are normally being made by weather. But today, it's not possible. You can't sit down on that kind of a chair, even if that chair is still available. But it's, no, it's not tenable in any uh, event anymore. Even very soon now, you discover that plastic chair will become an obsolete in an event. You can see that currently now in offices, there are some chairs that are coming in with economic, economic trust standard. Yeah. They are considering safety measures. So your knowledge about um, the asset and every other thing will inform the number of years you are going to assign to an asset. Just like an electric bulb, you can't assign five years for an electric electric bulb. Okay. Fine, we know it's a consumable. Okay. So I hope I shed a little bit light on that um, your question, Mr. Vis. Well, sir, well, the um, the way I understand is that invariably you uh, you one as a as a facility manager cannot have the same um this this the disposing time on a on a on an asset with that of an asset manage, manager that is what you have that's what i understand so if if, if, no. if an asset if an asset manager if, or an accountant says that a car or a, a, a or a generator they are yes. signing five years six years okay. Okay. before they net it out uh, before it goes into a net book value in their okay. own books you as a facility manager Putting your operations and maintenance process in place, you can say, okay, you can assign much more time to a fast to 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 to, to an asset than that of an uh, of an asset manager or an accountant. That's the way I understand it. No, see, am I they, am I am I am I okay? Let me share more light. Uh, I can understand it, sir. Let me share more light in that place. Mr. Afis, can you hear me, Mr. Afis? Yes, I'm still with you, sir. Okay. Depreciation is not determined at no. when an asset has spent one year or whatever. It is always determined at the beginning of the, of the life of an asset. 
is all depend on accounting principle of the company. So company we had the cost of planning, the cost of procuring, the cost of installation, and every cost. Maybe you buy cable or whatever that's associated with that particular asset, and they they add up everything together. They will now. That's the reason why it is always called a multidisciplinary activity, because it is not only addition that a facility manager can only decide. It requires you, your accountant, your MDCEO, possibly the asset manager itself. The three of you will form what we do, what we call forming, storming, norming, and performing. There is going to be a lot of argument, but you come to a term, then you now decide that this asset, we're going to depreciate this asset for a total period of 10 years. It is not an agreement that only a facility manager can decide, no. You will only offer your only technical knowledge about mm -hmm. that particular equipment. Like the one of generator that I mentioned, that mm -hmm. you can tell the team that, sorry, in this country we have 10 years is not possible for a generator to be depreciated. An accountant that can depreciate a generator for 10 years. An accountant can depreciate a generator for 15 years. But because you are well informed technically as a facility manager, you can argue it out that, sorry, 20 years is not tenable. This is Nigeria. But what is tenable is five years. They will tell you it's not possible. You argue, but at the end of the day, you come to a term. Then the, all of you cannot agree, OK, seven, we will agree on seven years. It is stamped. So it is not left for the accountant to not do the calculation of the depreciation value of that generator or that particular car and send it to it asset manager who will be doing the depreciation at every year. Taking a fleet as an example, as soon as the book value becomes zero, that is when all the depreciation uh, expenses on that um, particular asset has been expended. Then the book value becomes zero. Then you cannot start thinking about you want to sell that car off. If a corporate environmental decide, corporate company can decide that, okay, sorry, Keep the car there, let the car be rotting. We'll not sell it later. The only thing is that the wound is not costing the company any, any cost anymore, apart from the space that the car is occupying. But the only thing is that the amount of money they're supposed to make when they sell it immediately, when the book value becomes a zero, will not be up to what they are going to make after they have allowed the car to rot in for like a period of three years. The value will definitely depreciate. Uh, I guess so. I hope you, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky yes. to now. Yeah, yes, 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 clear yeah, answer. Okay, thank you very okay. much, sir. Yeah, okay, sir. Um, Madam Abayo, me right? Uh, Mr. Abayo, Mr. Okay, Mr. Abayo, me, yes, sir. Sir, okay. uh, sorry, in addition to what you have said, yes, sir, uh, what I've discovered in uh in many organizations, they have policies with regards to uh, asset uh, useful life. Okay. Because, for instance, at uh, United Nations now, all these United Nations uh, organizations mm -hmm. operating in the field, like all these international office of migrations, all these uh, uh, response uh, team reacting to humanitarian issues, crises, what they do is that they have a policy that they use their vehicle for five years or 150,000 uh, hours. So anything after that, what they do is that they sell up the vehicle and buy new ones. And uh, another thing uh, 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 with respect to that is the issue of a uh, generator. Is it right to do depreciation on generator based on uh, the number of years or the run as of the engine of that generator? If your management will allow you to me, I would prefer you use the number of running hours to determine the lifespan of a generator. Yes. Going by Nigeria factor. But at okay, times, sir. management might not, might not, my, my management might not accept that. They might want you to tell them in terms of, because of the accounting calculation and every other thing, they want you to tell them in terms of months. So you can use, you can use the number of hours to inform the number of months it will, the generator will last. So you can just like, um calculates okay let's say 10 10 operation hours every day assuming 
going by Nigerian factor, you are going to have six hours, you are going to have four hours of power and six hours on generator. So calculate that number of six hours and the office open Monday to Friday. That is five days. Multiply by, that means you have six hours multiplied by five. That is 30. Multiply by four. That is what? That is almost about 120 hours in a month. So you can use that one to determine the number of years that generator will run before you start thinking about doing overhauling and all the other stuff. Then you may mention something about the United Nations. If you look at the operation of the United Nations, you should know that most of where area and uh, places they visit, they are, they are, let me say, they are more or less exposed to a lot of security challenges. And what actually informed their decision about running their car for five years or certain number of hours that they dispose it of is that they don't want a situation whereby they are in a critical position that they can need to serve and the car can no longer perform. Because these are people that go to area where you have terrorist, terrorist um, challenges here and there, whatever. So the, what actually inform their depreciation period is security just like Nigerian army. They don't have to wait. And what Nigerian army does is that they use their new equipment in area that, are, that, are, that there is war. And once they know it gets to some certain whatever, they dispose it off to another area where they have less security risk or let's say less security threat. How would I inform your, Mr. Abayomi? Yeah, it's okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Aluayomi? Yes, thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much for the way you've been answering the questions because it's, you are actually killing the questions very well. I said, and again, maybe on um, this asset disposal, it depends on the policy of some, comp of some companies. Exactly. For instance, I love the point you are bringing that if you are using generator in Nigeria, you know that uh, you can't, it can't, the lifespan is going to reduce compared to that of Ghana. For instance, MTN as a principle, and I love their principle, once they are using HVAC, and once a new kind of say, uh, HVAC comes out, if they buy a new HVAC today, and new one comes up next year, they will change it immediately. They will dispose the old one. So they follow that. Okay, they follow the new trend. That once the new trend is coming in, let us buy this one yesterday. For the fact that the new trend has come in, they, it will outdate that one. So uh, I, I think so. It depends on different companies with their kind of principle. Thank exactly. you, sir. Exactly, Mr. Emmanuel. Exactly. You are perfectly right. And the reason why MTN is doing that is because they want to keep abreast of the technology. Yes. And the reason yes. why they know the market is not monopolized, so they have a lot of competitors. Thank you, sir. You they got have it a lot right, of competitors. <laughs> Mr. Abayomi, your hand is still up. Oh. So any other question again? Okay. In the absence of no question, we're calling the class a day. So we meet again tomorrow. Once again, my name is Akinola Emmanuel. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you tomorrow. No, till Friday. On Friday. Friday, Friday. You just said Friday. it now. <laughs> Friday. You just said it now. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. You have a lovely night.